listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lindenmeyer. My guest for episode 113 is Ganesh Seshadri, known to the world as Bid, the singer-songwriter for the British band The Monochrome Set. You are right now listening to their first big single, Eine Symphonie des Grauens, from 1979. The set has released 15 albums in three different phases, first from 1980 to 1985, and they broke up for a while, then from 1990 to 1995. Then Bid ran another project called Scarlet's Well for nine albums, and the monochrome set reformed in 2012 and has been going strong since then. Today we're going to be talking about a song called A2s from Fabula Mendax, their 2019 album, and we're going to look back to Walking with the Beast from Dante's Casino, 1990, And then to the original lineup with Adeste Fidelis from Love Zombies, 1980. We'll conclude by listening to another fairly recent tune, the title track from the Spaces Everywhere album, 2015. For more information, please visit themonochromeset.co.uk. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. And if you'd like to support the effort and get an ad-free feed, go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. I will have played a little bit of... Eine Symphonie des Grounds, the single from 1979. Why all the foreign... When we were using film titles, you know, and Eine Symphonie des Grounds was the German for A Symphony of Shudders, which was the 1922 Murnau film Nosferatu. That was the subtitle of the gotcha. film. Gotcha. Yeah. We thought, well, I thought that was a nice title, so bunged it on. After I'd written the lyric, and I had no idea what the lyric was about. And in fact, the lyrics that we're talking about today are lyrics where I sort of ha- do have an idea of what they're about. But quite a lot of the lyrics that I write are kind of semi-automatic. They just come out. And I still don't know what that song is, actually what the subject matter is. Yeah, it's interesting still to see the stylistic and the through line to the present. So we want to get pretty quickly to it's Fabula Mendax, 2019 is the album EUX. Well, it's pronounced Ertus. Ertus, okay. Ertus, yeah. Ertus is just an irregular French word. It just means all of them in French. And um, there is a similarity in feel between Eine Symphony and Ertus, I think, in my opinion. The kind of rhythmical, incessant beat and the very dark subject matter. All right, well, let's play it and then we'll talk about it in some detail. All of them I wanted all of them to die Oh, 
Histories to be forgot Shall a fallen and unborn And here, I'm here Celestial voices rejoicing the barren beers And I will cheer the shout of the beautifully free Spaces for portraits without a face And I will trace my finger down an empty tree Black hands and wet feet high Lit up with fireflies Swirl around my head Swirl around the day This be my be my bed All of them All of them All of them So this theatrical Spanish cowboy sort of theme, do you want to say a little where you were coming from with the tone of this? The music is kind of like almost big band Tamla and the drummer picked on that immediately. It is kind of, you know, because we're just, if anything, I know a lot of British bands were influenced by British music, by the Beatles and things. We weren't. We were more influenced by Motown. And there is something about that. I think, you know, I can just see, I mean, Martin Vandellas or something singing this, but not with those lyrics. This kind of girl band singing something like that with this big beat. But it just doesn't come across like that. Of course, once it goes through our slimy hands, it, it ends up as being very different. But it's a, And it's a very kind of rich thing. We just decided to throw the kitchen sink at it. So the whole thing is kind of rich and warm and dark. And you have all those lovely violins that come in in the chorus and stuff like that. But it's slightly psychopathic, the lyrics and the, and the beat of the song and kind of just rhythmical and it just keeps going. And the lyrics are somewhat, very slightly influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. One of the last poems he wrote, which were The Bells, it's an insane piece of poetry which is just very rhythmical and almost quite crude, but brilliantly written with an awful lot of internal rhymes. And it just, it's very compelling when you read it. And it's tumble into darkness, which is really what the song is. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a sort of a revenge orgy. Because it's similar to a little bit the second song on the album, Throw It Out the Window, is just throwing things out out of the house, which were given to you by people that you don't like. But Ertus is just straight ahead, wanting to kill everyone. <laughs> You could say that it's a teenage angst or something, but it's just very killing people, really killing people that have annoyed you. And it's also somewhat, um, doesn't derive from, but I, I took it as a sort of spirit to the song as well. There's a song called Pirate Jenny by Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill on the Thrupney Opera, which is sung by Lottie Linia. It's just a, a serving wench in a bar in Berlin, who just dreams of killing everyone that insults her. And pirates come into the bay and she joins up with them and they go in on a murderous rampage. But it's the kind of thing I suppose, you know, normal people do think about, but they don't actually express it, especially not in a song. Yeah, I was going to ask sort of about the distinction, maybe this is not a real distinction, between more literary songs, like this is a character and there's specific historical things either in the lyrics or suggested by the old-time musical accompaniment that, yeah, so mentioning Three Penny Opera seems right on the money, or is this a maybe exaggerated, maybe, uh, but s has some relation to a personal expression, you know, just like it, My Life by John Lennon, you know. The there's always a bit of personal expression in there, which I, I don't know what it's going to. <laughs> but, you know, I've had a, shall we say, I've had a strange life but it made me what i am i like the the destination but i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend the route to anybody it's slightly cathartic but you know everyone's songs are in some way or another i, I do like if there's a history in there then it might come from the words but i'm just influenced by that's how i learned how to write songs is by reading restoration poetry 18th century restoration poetry jonathan swift and things like that the people who weren't necessarily the greatest poets but very ly lyrical rhymers you know and i just picked up those words and i just love to pick up words and use things which aren't used in common speech but then that's what poetry used to be like at least 
So why not? You know, these words do all have some meaning, so I'll use them, especially when you know more words. It's easier to find rhymes, you know. I've got a rhyme in there somewhere which I will leap from body to body that rise bobbing in the neap. You know, I use the word neap as in tide, you know. Yes. <laughs> so I've just got, I know the word neap, so it was just useful because I could find something to rhyme with leap. It's just useful to have all that uh, library of words to draw from. It enriches the expression of what you want to say, I think. And I take it you are a lyrics and melody first writer? Funny thing is, I tend to do this it all at once. Mm -hmm. I tend to just sort of start with something. And I don't really write the music first, generally speaking. Sometimes I write a bit of a lyric first. But the music is made by the lyric, I think. Mm -hmm. You can just take that piece of music and very slightly change it. You take the lyric off it, it just doesn't sound the same at all. It's lyrics which make a band, I think, and the, and the expression of the lyrics through the music. The music is a kind of a carrier, and they both make each other powerful, but it's really the lyrics that are the, the real power. If you put a girl voice and a slightly different lyric on a Smith song, it just wouldn't be the same at all. You know, it's got to have something to say. You've got to have something to say on it, the way that you say it and the expression that you have. Well, I know that's something that you essentially did with Scarlet's Well, the project which we're not actually going to talk about anything by but you know you took a long break that's important in a way it's important because that's really when i thought i learned to write properly to really f fulfill a kind of being a wider deeper songwriter is after the band split up in 1996 and i know two of the songs that are, are written before that it's really post that period that i started to become much more of a poetic lyric writer so that was very, very important to me to get out of the monochrome set and do something where I was writing songs where people weren't expecting a certain thing, which it's rather difficult when you're in any band, you know. And I know a lot of good songwriters who are in successful bands who can't really go laterally because they just wouldn't, the fans wouldn't like it. But they're still very talented. They can do other things. So often they have to go off and do side projects and things, you know, because they, they're just not able to. That they're trapped by their success. Exactly. Is this, so is it an advantage that your stuff had not made it over to the States, at least not since I was only listening to Top 40 radio in the early 80s as a young... So maybe if I was slightly older, I would have gotten a, a hang on this as well. But I certainly recognize this as kin to a lot of the stuff, Soft Boys and XTC and things that I'm, I got very into in college. But has it been, you know, since you're, I guess, more of a cult band, that you have that freedom that you're sort of already expected to be unexpected? I think that since the very beginning, we didn't really care so much about chart success, commercial success, because we already had, from the very first three or four gigs, we'd built up quite a big live following. So we already had this big live following throughout, um, from 78 to 80, and then 81. And we had this paradox, is, is when we left Indisc after the first two albums in, in 1981, we had the two biggest kind of bands, virtually live bands in the UK were, were the monochrome set and Susie the Banshees and neither of us could get record deals. We weren't getting into the charts or, and, but we were playing in places where we had massively more people in the audience than people who were in the charts, you see. It's just a kind of weird thing so we've been okay. It's also bearing in mind that those, those early uh, Rough Trade singles of which Iron Symphony was one, they sold enough that nowadays or even in those days had those singles been allowed in the charts and they weren't Independent records sold from independent record stores weren't allowed in the charts full stop and they would have got into the top 10. They sold so many records. So it's not true to say that the certain bands which people might have thought, oh, they're perennial has-beens or whatever. No, we and they and a lot of the bands actually sold an awful lot of records. There was a band called Crass in the 80s who were one of the biggest selling bands in Europe, but people still barely know them, you know, because they just weren't in the charts at all. Yes, and I'm sure it's further distorted by which things of the British charts actually make it over to the U.S. is not. Yeah, yeah, and also which things actually make it to number one in the British charts, because there's an awful lot of tweaking going on, shall we say, when it comes to the charts. And I think it's also, it's longevity. You know, if you've got something to say and you keep doing new things and you keep moving forward and you just don't reproduce the same stuff, and maybe it was good that we weren't a big chart band in the early days and uh, so we didn't feel restricted in that way, uh, at least at that time, that we just kept pushing and doing different things and being in our own little bubble and being just creative, you know. We just kept up the long 
longevity because people then came to us because if they wanted to hear something new and, and various. So we kept going in that way. So let's again look back at the new song. So this is a self-produced, self-contained sort of thing. How, how did the arrangement come together on this? As I normally do, or as, or as I have done since the very late 90s, is I would write the song and I'd just demo it and I'd just send the demo to the band and then we start re- working on it. And the working, the, the, the kind of technical arrangements and things develop from just actual physical rehearsal, which is very important. And then you get as ideas from the, the way people react to it and the way people start playing towards it. And then you get ideas of how to just shift things around, you know. It's kind of difficult to describe, but that's, that's the way you do it. You know, after rehearsals, we go into the studio and start recording, and I just we work in this most fantastic studio with an incredibly sympathetic sound engineer who's also a very good producer and a multi-instrumentalist himself, John Clayton. And um, he knows an awful lot of musicians, so I just kind of kick my fingers and sew on a brass section, and he just gets in uh, some really, really good brass players, or in this case on this album, a, a great viola and violin and dulcimer player. And we just go from there. You know, whatever we actually specifically want for an album, ideas start coming in and think, yeah, okay, let's go for that, or let's do it digitally, or no, let's get some real people in. And it's just a kind of gentle layering process. And it's not all done in one go. It's done over a period of a few weeks, but a few days at a time to give us time to cogitate. You were saying that the lyrics write the music. The, the music writes the arrangement. I mean, this is a very coherent arrangement in terms of you know, what could we make it if, you, if you've already been playing, rehearsing live with this big drum harpsichord? That's a harpsichord, and, and then, you know, it goes into strings, and, and then we have various other things. And there's, in the background somewhere in the chorus, there's some very high choir vocals and stuff like that, you know. It is because I'm an experienced writer now, I pretty much know that what I write is going to be the arrangement. So I arrange and I write a song to make it that's pretty much going to be the final thing, except that we might say, well, let's make the middle eight just a few bars longer or a few bars shorter or something like that. But it's not really going to change that much because I kind of know what I'm doing, if you like. Well, I was wondering in particular about the drums going to the second verse. Let me just play a little bit of that. All of them, I've hated all of them since I... So that the drums have gone to this double-time military thing. And that's fantastic. See, I didn't expect him to do that. <laughs> so that's one thing. It's that, that's why I love working with him, because he does things that I don't expect him to do. So he did a, a fairly basic pattern on the first verse. And in the second verse, he did, he did the military drumming. And on the third verse, he does both. I think he goes from one to the other. And I just didn't think he was going to do that at all. And that didn't change the song. But it's often the case that he will actually do a drum part because cause what we, how we do it is we lay down, I lay down guide vocals and guide guitar to a click track at the beginning and then the bass and drums go down. And sometimes I'll just change, and then I overlay rhythm guitars, but I'll change the, the feel of the rhythm guitar slightly if the drums have already altered the feel slightly of the track. So that's the only time when it notably changes which is, has, has happened in the past two albums, I'll just, he'll do something on the drums and I think, oh, that's quite good. I'm just going to accentuate that a little bit. Yeah, and we tweak little things here and there. You know, we might slightly change a bass drum pattern or something like that because we just think, or oh, he's kind of creating as he goes as well. So we'll just tweak it a little and make the whole thing more kind of compact and together. It just works brilliantly like that. So it's, is it the final lead vocal or it's just a guide track and you wait until pretty much everything's on to... I wait until everything's on because because in, in the first day, in one day, I do all the rhythms and all the vocals. And normally with the vocals, I'll only do two or three vocals a day, uh, lead vocals. And I'm doing with guitars and little bits of lead guitar as I go. Because I'm doing quite a few rhythm guitars, you know, I do, I do acoustic and electric, mm-hmm. basically. And I, I can do additions as well, maybe on the 12 string or something here and there. And I'm just putting a lot of little bits of guitar throughout the tracks, all the tracks, just to fill in little gaps, which I think that needs it, or just take things out or whatever. There's constant, constantly changing stuff around, you know. The vocals, after about a third vocal take, I get really tired as well. Sure. I'm really putting an awful lot into it. And I can just hear the voice slightly going, so I'll just come in the next day and start again. 
So we kind of layer the whole album up like that. And then after that happens, we'll bring the keyboardist in and he'll be there and he'll do virtually the whole album in about three or four days. With the additions of the engineer, co-producer, John Clayton, he, he also does keyboards. So after the keyboardist goes, sometimes I think, actually, no, I still want this. And I still want this or that, like the uh, accordion part on a song called I Can't Sleep which we thought, oh God, no, it'd be great to have some kind of Tex-Mex accordion. So he just did that. That's where I recorded the whole thing, and it just builds up this whole thing, and it was just ideal. It just went with the whole lyrics and the music and this constantly at you, swirling cloud of, what is that? What, what is that swirling black cloud that Lovecraft used to write about? I can't remember. Just billowing towards you. I need to stop us for a second and thank our sponsor, Masterclass which lets you learn from the best with exclusive access to online classes taught by masters of their craft. 60 different instructors across tons of categories. There's literally something for everyone. I know I've told you a lot about the music courses crossing all genres with luminaries like Herbie Hancock, Hans Zimmer, Christina Aguilera, Reba McIntyre, Usher, Danny Elfman, Itzhak Perlman, Carlos Santana, etc., This week, I was preparing for an episode on Martin Scorsese for my Pretty Much Pop podcast, and so I listened to about two-thirds of his course on filmmaking, including Lecture 23, The Power of Music, which talks about his discovery for his early films that you don't actually have to come up with a score. You can use the kind of music that would people be just listening to on the radio or in the environments you're filming, and how he uses music even played on set to time camera movements, to inspire the cast... It really just thinks of the music as not just an arbitrary addition to a particular set of image, but just as integral. So for me, it was illuminating to kind of visit the image to sound equation from the other direction from my usual approach, where I might be thinking in songwriting of how do I visualize what I'm trying to convey through sound. For Scorsese, it's how do I convey this singular emotion through the combination of both. So in conclusion, I highly recommend the Masterclass Annual All-Access Pass, which gives you access to every Masterclass. And as a Nakedly Examined Music Podcast listener, you get 15% off an All-Access Pass. Just go to masterclass.com slash examined. That's masterclass.com slash examined for 15% off Masterclass. So speaking of accordion, let's throw out the second song to consider sort of how this process has changed over time. Walking with the Beast. Yeah, Walking with the Beast. This is way back from... Dante's Casino 1990, but has a similar high profile rhythm section, various ethnic, sometimes Spanish y overtones. We're actually on all three of these songs, have some of that. And in this case, has just like the song we just heard, extra little percussion bits all over the place and this crazy, in this case, accordion part. Do you want to say a little about this before we play it? Part of that song was written by the original drummer, J.D. Haney, in, in the monochrome set. And he used to write an awful lot of the lyrics in the first two albums, and he still used to send me lyrics. And there were two or three lines that he wrote in a particular song. I think Walker with the Beast and the title of the song. And a couple of lines from the chorus, and I just wrote the rest of the lyric around it. And it's very much had the feel of Brecht about it again. And again, it was just insistent and heavily lyrical. And just, um, also not just Brecht, it was, God, who, the, who wrote Port of Amsterdam? You know, the Belgian, the guy who used to smoke millions of Gitan. I can't remember his name. Anyway, just that sort of feel about it, this kind of like pre-war French, Belgian, German feel about the lyric. It's just inevitable when you sing with guitar. Well, I mean, it, everything's got this heavily written guitar feel about it, really, because that's, that's the song. And I have that problem on live here when we play live. We play live and we get a sound mix and they always turn the room guitar right down and I just say, don't do that because like, that's part of the the sound of the band. It's like this really strong rhythm guitar right at the beginning. It's like, can you imagine a sound engineer doing it to Joni Mitchell, you know, turning her guitar right down? It doesn't make any sense because that's, that's the song. That's half of the song. People don't get that sometimes, but maybe because most bands rhythm guitar is just, it's just plonking away really boringly in the background, but it's not with us. It's a major part of the instrumentation. The exotic feel to the whole thing, it's already sort of started, you know, it started from the, the early period of the monochrome set, it's just bringing in all these influences. Really, we were so influenced by American music and the exotic influences from, from the West Coast and uh, Texas Psychedelia and things like that.
It's not that all your songs are Spanish cowboy songs. We just happened to pick a couple that <laughs> had a little of that feel with the tremolo guitar sustain thing and other elements like that. When you really start to explore melodic guitar, then you kind of go towards that sort of thing. If you're looking for any guitar work, which is not just Richie Blackmore guitar work, it's melodic guitar work, then you go towards your start point is the ventures and, and anything that plays a kind of memorable melody, you know. And then you can go into Rai Kudra and whatever, all the guitarists that actually play melodies that people can remember, rather than just, wow, wasn't that an amazing solo with lots of harmonics and things like that, which you can't remember. I mean, I think there are guitarists who are genius players, but I can't remember a single note they've ever played. And then there are people on the cusp, like Hendrix. But I just like people, I just like that. And once you get into that feel of, okay, what's the best accordion music played? Well, anything that you can remember, so it's Flaco Jimenez and that kind of thing. Then you get back to America again, and then you get the, all the kind of exotic stuff, you know. But it's the American's distillation of world music is to make it melodious. And the same thing on the, if I may mention the new album again. There's a song on it called uh, La Chanson de la Pucelle, where there's orchestration on it, uh, string orchestration, which I wrote, all wrote on guitar. But it's very much an American style of string orchestration, very 50s, very musical, very Doris Day, <laughs> stagecoachy type of thing. And it's very melodic, and you wouldn't find that on a lot of other people's albums if they're going to put orchestration on it. No, this is just sweet, sweet, melodious, poppy type of things. So when we have an instrument, it's got to do something. It can't just sit there and just clonk along. It's got to actually make a point of itself, make a point of existence. It's got to justify itself. Yeah, let's talk about that with the in terms of like for the instance the piano and the chorus. It's me ever so Is there a specific kind of, is that a samba in particular? I'm trying to think if there's a... 
So that was awesome presence on piano, and he was brilliant. And yeah, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know what you call that music, but it's kind of like, uh, it is sort of uh, Central or South American. I don't really know, I don't really care. But The, the Cuban, Ricky Ricardo, you know. That. That's exactly, it. yeah, it's Cuban, that's right. And yeah, it is, it's like, it's a mishmash of stuff. But it just works, you know. So it doesn't really matter, we're not trying to be one thing, we'll just take something and just, well, we're going to chuck it in there, you know. It's like fusion food, you know, but not fusion food to impress people, but fusion food just because it works. So we'll just chuck that in there because it works. It's different if you're David Byrne and you're doing an album like the Ray Momo where you're, I'm going to teach the world about Latin music or, you know, the Ry Cooter going down to Cuba and recording all the musicians there. Whereas if you, in a pop setting, you know, even back to the Beatles, if they're pulling out some you're trying to pull on a part of your subconscious. You know, you're, you're pulling on a type of music that you probably never actually sat down and, you know, studied a lot of, but it's this thing that, you know, was on TV, maybe on... It's going in a direction where it's exciting because you think, oh, I've not heard that, and it works really well. There's a part of it which is selfish. It's not in trying to impress people. It's just getting you think, oh, my God, I've not heard anything like that before. That's fantastic. And it just works, and it's just exciting, you know to do something like that. I'm really not interested in replicating. Although we do sometimes replicate things which people have done before, and that's fair enough, and and we're sort of relaxed about that, you know, if we just do a ordinary rock or a pop song or whatever. If it just works, it works. But sometimes I just love going and getting somewhere where you think, this is great, and you feel smug about it, you know, you kind of get somewhere you think, this is fantastic, I've never heard anything like this before. It doesn't really matter if people get it or not. I mean, maybe subconsciously they will. But it's exciting to do that. It's art to do that. I don't want to just replicate, just bring out some, well, you know, Rai Kudru also worked with some African musicians and it was fantastic to actually hear that stuff. But it just doesn't interest me at all. Just to put things on, no, I'll use that instrument, but I'll use that instrument in a way that they don't use it. I'll just use that instrument, all those weird string instruments that they use and it sounds fantastic, but I'm not going to use it like them. You know, I'm not, not going to have like, 20 minutes of just plonking away on a bloody string thing, pardon the language. I'm going to chuck it in somewhere that I think, oh, well, it could do with some shimmery things in there, and we'll just chuck it on, you know. Well, if you're talking about pulling these various elements in, it's not just I'm creating a new mixture of things that you haven't heard before, but I'm doing it in a way that is immediately danceable and accessible, at least in this case of this song. I think it's really important for any artist to really listen to stuff and to really try to enjoy it. I mean, listen to a really wide range of things if possible. Also lyric writers and listen to the great, the towering geniuses like Fats Waller of of pre-war music and listen to other sorts of music and listen to the sounds and listen to things. It, It kind of bugged me sometimes, you know, once when I said to some musicians, well, we were talking about vocals. I said, well, do it, do it the way the Eagles used to do it. And they said, the Eagles, you must be joking. I can't stand them. And I thought to myself, what are you talking about? I'm just saying do it like that. It's like, because you've got to know how other people do it. You know, it's, it's like being an artist. I mean, a painter would go into an art gallery and just and not really look at the results. They would just look at the technique of how Constable we would do clouds or how Degas would just get this wash of things or how Turner would do something. And it's just, it, it just goes into your subconscious and you learn how to do certain things and you don't feel subconscious or you don't feel guilty or you don't feel stupid doing it because it sounds good. I mean, 50s American harmony vocals are just tremendous, you know, and you can't get better than that. And you can do variations on it and you can put maybe some kind of madrigal force in there or something and make it kind of interestingly weird, but there's nothing like it. So that's the way you do it. So you can almost fall back on things that if you're in a a studio and you're recording something, and if you don't listen to all that stuff and you don't look at the past and you don't look at the way people have done things, then you've got nothing to fall back on and nothing to bring in to what you're doing. You can't go in any direction at all if you don't know all the directions that other people have taken. Yeah, can we say something in terms of the poetry sources of this? And maybe this involves trying to pull apart what parts were J.D. Haney and what parts were were you, if that is relevant. But first, just the chorus. I mean, this pretty much, if you're ever doing, oh, muscle of love, oh, you know, this this sort of poetic, and muscle of love, kiss me ever so sweetly, I'm, I'm singing to the universe or something like this. Want to say something about kind of where that sort of gesture comes from for you? The whole song is written partly as a kind of, old-fashioned 
Shakespearean chorus, so it's like written as someone commenting on someone, and also partly written by the person, uh, partly sung in the voice of the person, him or herself. This song is very, very personal and dark, and it's not singing out to the world at all, it's singing to, shall we say, himself. It's like a whisper to himself, the whole song. It's a dark whisper. So yeah, putting that part and the I love you madly, I'll kiss you gladly in the context of the first verse. Yeah. A crumpled suit, a man filled with one desire to taste the milk of human kindness, wear a shroud of velvet blindness. So this was all in the source material again, too, that you got from... No, no, I wrote all that. Okay. Love is a drug. That's really what the whole song is, it is but I'm just making a piece of board chicken into a curry. <laughs> That's all. I'm just foliating it. The whole thing is just about the one thing. It's just about a man who is just obsessed with not necessarily sex, but just the whole thing, eroticism mainly, I suppose. Well, loss of control, right? Yeah, it's kind of like loss of control in the same way that it's a, he's a kind of sexaholic, but not for the sake of sex, erotaholic. Or something. It's civilization and its discontents that <laughs> the erotic looking to break free. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, this is a part of civilization. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the delicious thing about it. This is as much as part of civilization as Chartres Cathedral. So interesting structure to this song because it's not just verse, 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 and then chorus. It's verse with a B section, but then back to the verse, and then, then here's the actual chorus. I do verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, end. That's the basic structure, but sometimes the verses have a double section to them, which they do on on the latest album on a couple of tracks. And sometimes the middle eight is just instrumental and sometimes it's vocal. And it's just a kind of thing that I do. I think that by the time you get about a minute and a half or two minutes into a song, you kind of need a refrain from it or a break from it a little bit so that along comes the middle eight and it's just a little bit different. You know, Dylan's songs will just be verse, verse, verse and a little bit of a chorus and verse, and it goes on for about six minutes. And it's all very well, but after about three minutes, I get a bit tired of it, you know. I sort of pace myself and he doesn't. I'm not saying I'm better than him, but, you know, he doesn't kind of do that. He keeps that intensity all the way through and and it's a bit too much for me, I think. Well, and that is a symptom of writing the lyrics first. There's no way you just sit down with a guitar and then come up with your 10th verse. Like, no, that's, you filled a couple pages and then you pick up the guitar and you sing those couple pages. No, really. I mean, with this song, I think that with all the songs, you know, I start with a couple of lines, maybe, and then the music comes and the whole thing flows. It seemed to me, yeah, I mean, I don't really know with him, but it seemed to me that he was he was writing all the lyrics first, yeah, in a kind of way that he knew that he could put music to. Probably on a scroll. <laughs> well, I know he, he used to write, I think, on a, on a kind of big whiteboard with words all over the place. I seem to recall that I've seen a couple of films of him doing that, and it was just a complete mess, and he'd start putting the whole thing together, and really, in a similar way to me or to other people who would write very lyric-orientated songs, it's almost the case that the first verse could even be the last verse. The whole thing is just a massive stuff, and you kind of put it into... I don't really write it like that, you know, but I do tend to write... I sort of think, oh, that's a good line. I'll just put that on the side, and I'll put it in later, you know, <laughs> but that's not right for the, this section of the song. So it's so a whole load of... It's just very, very scrappy. So I'll have... Uh, particularly with, for example, a tooth, I just sort of had to move lines around quite a lot and then structure it a little bit more. But And I think probably, I can't remember how I wrote Walking the Beast, but it was probably the same kind of thing. That was it, like words would come into my head. Often when I'm just, you know, in the kitchen frying an onion, <laughs> a phrase would come into my head and I'd sort of race into the front room and just write it down and I'd just put it in somewhere, you know, at some point in the song. I mean, there's a song, an old monochrome set cut song called The Jet Set Junta, which people think it was like a heavily constructed song, but the whole song wrote itself in about 10 minutes flat. And I think the same thing with Iron Symphony. So there are some songs which, which don't have a lot of lyrics to them and they just write themselves immediately. And I don't have any control over it at all. It just all comes out, you know, another part of my body, another part of my brain. Songs like this would just be a lot of phrases to a degree put together, but I would have a fairly strong control about the the flow of the the way things should be. 
Well, let's point out just one piece of the arrangement that can feel like an alien presence, a collaborator entering with their own melody, which is a guitar solo. Let's play a second of that. So like you said, kind of the ventures lead again. And it just seemed to work. It's a bit incongruous. But it just seems to work somehow. It's a little bit odd maybe, but maybe something, something you might see in Once Upon a Time in the West or something. I don't know. So I assume that was Lester Square, not you, playing that one? I wrote the part, but I can't remember which one I played it. Well, that's, so that was the question, whether the guitar solos, because I know he you know, wrote guitar instrumentals, you know, very much yeah. sounds like in, influenced by Ventures and that sort of uh, instrumental stuff. But this one fit in so well, so you're saying that's because you actually wrote the line, or at least in outline. We used to collaborate an awful lot in the early days, and quite a lot of this stuff that was on the, the Dante's Casino album in 1990, I'd, I'd already written before the band reformed. And in fact, we had done a demo of this song in the intervening period, in probably in, in 88 or 89. So, you know, we already knew how to go, and I'd already written the solo to it. But our styles at that time period were kind of similar to guitar players, and we both took influence from the same period. It's not just the ventures, it's also late 60s garage, pebble-style American music. Was it not a given when you got the band back together in 90? Who, who exactly was going to be in it? I saw... Lester hadn't been in for a couple of the last years before the breakup. Because and... I'd been in the fashion business and I'd had a kind of bangle the first annual Love Circus with Awesome Presence. And just around, we had actually thought around, we'd met in about 89 and thought, should we get the band back together again? And we weren't too sure. And then, and then this guy called Tetsuya from Japan offered me a solo tour in Japan. I thought, no, hang on a minute. How about we get the monochrome set back together and we do an album? And we got that band back together, but with the addition of Awesome Presence. And our current drummer, Mike Urban, actually was in the band at the time. He left and, and joined another band because he thought they were going to go somewhere. <laughs> but he's, he's happy because we've just come back from Japan. So he missed out uh, our crazy hard day's night tours in Japan. Where we were chased around the streets by fan, mad, crazy fans. But anyway, we just got back yesterday, actually, so he's been there for the first time, so that's good. But we kind of had a setup, so I just wanted like a quick, easy setup, and Orson was great because he came in and he was not, not a brilliant multi instrumentalist, and he played great guitar as well. So a lot of that album from which this song comes from has a lot of twinly guitar on it. And I didn't care that what people expected, we just did a rock album with twinkly guitars on it. And it was just fantastic play doing that live as well. Well, maybe this is the time to flip back to that original lineup. Adeste Fidelis was the song that I would picked from Love Zombies 1980. Do you want to say a little about that before we play that? We played that song on Saturday in Tokyo with Lester as well. And yeah, it was just possibly, what can I say about it? Because it's actually a long time ago that I wrote that song. But obviously it comes from prayers, you know, Christian prayers directed towards Jesus, which at the time I was sort of reading some of these things. I used to write, read a lot of poetry and a lot of it, and I just get, came across this book of it, and I just thought that there was something, with all due respect to the faith, that I thought there was something disturbingly sexual about some of those. So I took the Christianity out, and I just kind of left a lot of the kind of feeling and some of the phraseology in there. Then you get this kind of pornographic song, which I think it is anyway. Spirituals 
my heart is indicting the good matter. I speak of the things which I have made unto the king. My tongue is a pen. Song of joy. So again, I don't know if it's just the rim shot there. We, this suggests a Latin sort of beat to me, and it's definitely danceable in that way. But you have a couple different textures here. This song, in a fairly short time frame, goes some different places and jumps keys and does has this weird fake out and ends it with a riff in a different key than the rest of the song. Do you want to say a little about those twists and turns? Well, I think that in that period of the first two albums, we were still in experimental seriously experimental pop mode we're really experimenting with arrangements and stuff that's why i kind of think that there is a vague vague similarity between early monochrome set and very early blondie and to a degree some of the more commercial frank zappa stuff like you are what you is is just kind of experimenting with the way you'd arrange a song not necessarily having choruses in there you just put two verses together and that kind of thing, and you would experiment with keys, and we kind of stopped a little bit after that and just went exploring in different avenues because there's only so much you could do. Well, was some of that a matter of swapping out drummers? Because some of what's most distinctive about these early albums to me are the, like, on this song, what just happened with the toms in the chorus, this offbeat thing that is still catchy, but... He was incredibly creative, a very intelligent guy, very, very creative, very similar to the drummer that we have now. And we used to rehearse an awful lot and just try different things out. And yes, it is true that the drummers played a, a much um, bigger role in the first two albums at the time of, of the you know, first few albums, shall we say, because he was like that, because he, was, he would approach it very intellectually. And it was just so, therefore, it was very interesting. But you could say, in a way, from the point of view of a writer, that you, that could make you lazy, because then you would expect you know, someone to come up with something or whatever. It just seemed to work and in rehearsals and stuff, and that's the way we recorded it. So, well, he just fancied doing something, so he just went ahead and did it, and it worked, you know. The story of my discovery of interesting music as I got into college was discovering that this stuff I'd been listening to the early 80s, you know, as a, as a kid, the smartest of it was 
post-punk or I think of as post-prog, so that we're you all fans or reacting to, in some ways, this, you know, a decade of Yes and King Crimson and all this kind of stuff, because there's, you know, it's danceable, but it's still got remnants, just like the Talking Heads and those other kind of bands. I don't think that the rest of the band were into, but, well, Andy was kind of partly into Yes a little bit, but he was kind of more of a Stones guy, and Lester was more of a, just a kind of psychedelic, you know, late 60s psychedelic, and uh, John, I don't really know, but more into really kind of boz gags, that kind of thing, and I don't really, yeah, I was kind of into that, but, I mean, the problem with prog is that as a young musician, as someone who wanted to really get into playing music, you heard this stuff, and it was just so complicated and so advanced, you couldn't do it. That's really why bands like the Velvets and the Stooges were so influential because they were so powerful and so good and they just had two chords and you could write songs and you could suddenly be relevant to yourself and to your own generation. And then you'd start putting things in, but I don't think consciously we were putting things in to be proggy. It was just to experiment and to be more interesting. It seemed to me that an awful lot of stuff that was supposedly punk was just really pop songs done in a slightly different way. There were some interesting people that were doing pop songs in a slightly different way, like the Buzzcocks, but an awful lot of people were just really just, they got their Stanley knives out and they, they chopped their suits to ribbons and suddenly they were punks, you know, or they doubled the speed of their songs like the Vibrators and suddenly they were punks and they weren't punks at all, you know, they never were, they were just pub rock band. We just wanted to do something and there was the opportunity to experiment and to go into areas which the prog bands didn't do. They were just caught up in a sort of fantasy path and this was just taking things back, you know. And the Talking Heads got their own sound by just being aggressive and young and being more beat orientated than us, certainly. So that's the way people experimented. Yeah, I was surprised when I heard I'm trying to find on this 1979 or uh, complete recordings, the very first recordings, which I guess was before you even called the monochrome set, but it sounded very, very Velvet Underground. Oh, there's a song called Inside Your Heart. That is exactly what I'm thinking of, yes. Yeah, there, uh, there's some, uh, who's the band that really covered it? Yellow Tango or something recently? I thought it was hilarious. Because I wrote that song when I was 14, you know, I was just <laughs> sort of, you know, I made a demo of it. And I actually took it to record companies and they said, oh, that's quite good. And they didn't sign me up. To me, it's just like a kind of a song that a 14 year old would write. It was just like a, a simple thing and it? it's just taught me how to write songs, that's all. It's just a little experiment. It's like sometimes you'd see like an early piece, a table made by a decent furniture maker, but a table he made when he was 15. And it's, oh, it's quite a nice table. Not a masterpiece, you know, but a table, just a table. Um, and that's it. You know, they wanted to put it on the album. So I thought, okay, well, whatever. But to me, it's kind of nothing. <laughs> All right, so it's not that the Velvet Underground is the secret source of all your later songwriting, which is what... No, it's really just, it kind of like inspires you. And I think the monochrome set, when they say monochrome set have been influential, there's a couple of bands, which I won't name, well, more than a couple of bands who have actually ripped us off, but there's the people that have been inspired by us, I hope that have been inspired by us, have just shown people, because we've just gone off and done things without thinking of the consequences. <laughs> You can do that. You can write lyrics like that, and you can put guitar pieces like that in there. You don't have to thrust away, constantly bashing away with heavy fuzz. You can actually put stuff in there, and it works, and it's interesting. And, you know, so in that way, I, I hope we have been influential, just showing that you can do all these little things all over the place. And yes, you can have harmony vocals in it. There's, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. <laughs> you can do stuff like that, and, you know, you can give flowers to a woman and you know you can put harmony vocals on a record do you know what i mean in this case with adesti fidelis actually having the no it's not enough to have oh thou who came from above kindle a flame of sacred love but then the talking part which is just jumps right out like that no this is an actual prayer of some sort it seems much more of a risk than merely including backing harmonies (laughs) yes uh <laughs> yeah, I actually sing that now purely because I wouldn't get heard if I, if I, uh, with the PAs we use, <laughs> if I just spoke it. But, and it sounds really good, sung. Yeah, well, I don't know why I did that, but uh, there you go, I did. So, <laughs> but it is kind of like lascivious a bit, you know, to me. <laughs> it maketh the song, I think. 
very showmanly throughout. And I guess, you know, what's fun about this song and a lot of, a lot of the stuff, at least from this era, you know, when I was saying drawing on Latin is a matter of reaching your subconscious, there's a lot more early sixties, what 1962, how old were you then? <laughs> Just <laughs> four. And I was I was in Calcutta at the time. <laughs> okay, so maybe not the best example, but I'm I'm just thinking. I hear, and in fact, this is going to be a good transition to the song we're going to leave with, which is "Spaces Everywhere," the title track from "Spaces Everywhere" 2015, which is very much a like 1966 prog. Like it's not full on Nights in White Satin, but it's getting there. And I hear, you know, from around in that song, there's kind of elements of Chocolate Watch Band and things like that. It's kind of like slightly folky 60s you know just just the kind of electric folk light 60s feel to that song i think yeah in the current song and a lot of this other stuff it's these what i just associate with an early 60s or mid 60s dance party sort of sort of vibe or you know some of these (laughs) things things from tv god partridge family you mean (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i wouldn't say (laughs) that that is not the thing that immediately came to mind have you detected partridge family vibes on some of your tunes (laughs) i don't know well possibly possibly or or the monkey's head or something like that yes yes well any monkeys yes (laughs) well yeah i mean i love that you know my god yeah i love that but you know people forget that you've got to have the song in the first place so the style is, is kind of irrelevant so if you've got the song in the first place that's the thing about that particular song. If you if we had the song in the first place, and the obvious way to me to go with that song is in that direction, not to, to go into the too dark direction of her tooth and and or the too kind of rhythmical of of the other songs, and it's just to to go with that light flow. Well, it worked, and with the with the flute on it as well, that's brought out the song. And then you've got a problem. You know, you've got to think about whether or not you want to do the whole album like that. You know, so you've got to think about the structure of the whole album, not just the song. The advantage of the way we, I'm writing at the moment is that I tend to write whole albums within a, a space of two or three months so that the songs have a kind of a, a stylistic integrity behind them so that we can go in a particular direction of production and aesthetics on an album. You know, it's true that each album is subtly or maybe not so subtly different. Yeah, do you want to say a little more just to get us to this last bit to complete the history that you had your initial lineup, the sort of classic lineup that established the sound in very rhythm section heavy, very experimental, and then you break up and you get it back together. And I actually think that Walking with the Beast that we talked about is is maybe a little more quirky than a lot of those songs from that era, that there's a lot more you know straight beats. I think in the 90s, it was straighter. And the 90s was a kind of a not a good period, I think, for music generally. And it was a little bit difficult for us to find what we were and what we were doing. It was almost felt like we were kind of together to play Japan or something. I thought we wrote an awful lot of really good material then, but it was not as experimental as it didn't go in directions, which I, I kind of wanted to. And that's really why, even though we did five albums, or admittedly in the space of five years, that's really why I split the band up because I really wanted to do something very different. I had been doing different things at the time, um, producing other bands and things, and I just wanted to do something different. And now we're in a period where we're much more creative, there's a creative flow about it. But it's just, it's, I think for a lot of bands, that period of the 90s was just very difficult. It's just difficult to explain why it was like that. But I think that the distance between bands and the audience, because the internet wasn't around then, and neither really were, were papers, weekly newspapers so that there was a real gap between what you're doing and what the audience were liking or not liking and what you thought and I can't really describe it exactly because there, there is a degree of interaction between a band and the wider public although I say we're in a bubble there's still a little bit of that so I can't really say but I think I, those albums are actually all going to be re-released as a box set in January or February next year they're very good albums. They've got some really good songs on it, but they're not, not as various in their sound and their experimentation as the early stuff and also the later stuff. So are these six albums with the new lineup? Do you see that as a continuation of the Scarlet's Well thing you started, or that was just a, you know, a side project, an experiment? I mean, I did seven albums with Scarlet's Well, so it was a full on thing and it was, they actually, you know, it's virtually been forgotten, but they sold really well. <laughs> first two or three albums sell better than the Monaco set, but it's just kind of been forgotten, but that's the way it is. You gotta re-release them. I could only find a few things on YouTube. I've got to find a way of putting them all on Spotify as well, because they've just, they've just 
been caught in that particular era where, I mean, the record company went bust, and I've just got to find some way of actually getting them out again. And I will in the next six months or so. But in the next next year, with the box set of five and the re-release of individually of Stranger Tick and Love Zombies, we've got seven albums being released next year. So it's like I've got to like bide my time a little bit. But I, I will be doing that. And in the meantime, we've just got a lovely creative flow and, you know, we've had the same lineup for two uh, albums. And it's just a question of who dies first, you know. I mean, someone dies, you know. No, li- li- literally. There's a famous uh, British comedian called Ken Dodd who who died a couple of years ago I think and while he was on his deathbed he was still writing jokes and it's really that's what showbiz is all about you kind of keep going until you die and that's what we're going to do now we've decided and you know if someone dies unless it's me because I write all the songs unless it's me if someone dies it's just going to be replaced and we just keep going until we just you know we all end up at the crematorium there you go you're not going to pass it off to your descendants (laughs) you know we're not going to hand it down because I think we've been handing it down already so you know there's bands who have been nicking stuff off us can carry on and become millionaires and we'll just keep going in our own bottom of the just above the bottom of the barrel it's very comfy down here I can tell you nice warm and cozy well, all right. So again, here's spaces everywhere. So this is the last <laughs> album with Lester Square on it, right? On your original guitarist. That's right. Yeah. Well, that. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Yeah, I think this run of the last what six, seven albums now since you got back together is definitely the most as endearing as the early stuff is. Like this is maturity is nice. <laughs> Let's say. Thank that. you. <laughs> Just where that space is, there used to be a head Thinking lantern thoughts The size of planets, the colour of rain But I don't think I'll see it again Just where that chair is, there used to be a shape Of things to come Multi-dimensional scatterbrain And I don't think I'll see it again There are spaces everywhere There are spaces everywhere Here a film noir, there a drama Played is there used to be a hand holding a spoon up, waving expressively in the air. The reason is buried somewhere. There are spaces everywhere. I see here a lesson, there a history. Step is a used to be a laugh Rising to the sky Twisting infectiously as it soars And I don't think I'll hear it anymore There are spaces everywhere I find Hear a song of something lost in Spaces everywhere
Thanks so much to Bid and to Robert Vickers, who set up this interview. I had not heard of the monochrome set and regard this as a major find, a leading figure in the post-punk movement, one of my favorite eras of music. But they just didn't happen to have gotten a hit over in the States. Though Andy Warren, the bass player, was a member of Adam and the Ants, who did have some hits over here. And the monochrome set was definitely influential on bands like Morrissey in particular that did make some splash over here. So you have heard of them indirectly at least. To learn more about the band, check out themonochromeset.co.uk. My next interview will be with Michaela Ann, so more songwritery country music, and I've got three recorded since then, most recently with Chris McQueen, the guitarist for Snarky Puppy, which is really nice groove-based fusion, and you should also check out his smaller ensemble, Fork, spelled F-O-R-Q, and I've got some more great stuff lined up to record in the upcoming weeks. And as always, I need to remind you about patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic to get an ad-free feed and help make sure this podcast continues. So it's a good 2020 so far. Hope you're doing well. Keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Linsenmeyer signing off.